I'm not an expert at doing concrete and I've done enough concrete to know that I'm not. <laughs> so when I get an opportunity to see what other people are doing that are professionals that have put their 10,000 hours in, I'm all ears. For this particular project we're going to be pouring in the middle of January in Utah which usually has temperatures about 20 degrees or so and a lot of snow on the ground. This particular year we had a very mild winter and I was able to get the foundation in close to Christmas and then do this floor pour in January. So there's a couple of things that I'll tell you right now that you can do if you're doing concrete in the cold. Ryan's Mobile One. Concrete, you can do it in any weather, at any time, but the temperature affects the chemical reaction that happens uh, between the water and the lime and the concrete mix. Uh, nowadays there's a whole new mix compared to what it used to be. It used to be pretty idiot proof and you could pour a really thick pad really cheap when there was a lot of non-renewable resource sand available to do. Nowadays, you know, it's like how many you know, the sand that we use like for a beach or in concrete mixing and whatnot It's a certain granule that's ideal and perfect and it takes millions of years to make it to go from rock You know that used to be uh, Lava or silica or whatever pushed up through the earth and weathered down and beaten and pulverized into a fine uniform kind of a piece So nowadays they use all kinds of fillers like ash um, but when you're doing stuff in the cold, you got to alter that even more and you got to add calcium. When you add calcium, then it helps to cause it to cure even though it's cold. It'll help that chemical reaction to come around and firm up. Uh, but if it's too cold or if you don't have sunshine or you don't have all these different things, I mean even wind moving across the concrete can cause it to dry at different times. So another thing that you can do is you can start the chemical reaction off with hot water from the plant when you buy the concrete you pay a little extra you get hot water and calcium and then you can do concrete in the winter but then there's certain precautions that you have to do to make sure that on the th second or third day it doesn't freeze because remember water is one of the components of concrete and what concrete is it's drying that water can freeze that freezing causes an expansion it can break those bonds that are being formed as the concrete dries there's two things that are guaranteed to happen to concrete once you pour it. Number one, that concrete is going to get hard. And number two, it's going to shrink and it's going to crack a little bit. And so there's things that you can do to control where it cracks. You know it's going to crack for sure. It's just a matter of controlling the cracking. One of the things you can do is rebar and that helps reduce cracking. Another thing that you can do is make control joints. Like in this garage right here, you have what I call caster canyons, uh, but I've actually filled them with leveling compound. And then of course it cracks right in the middle of the leveling compound. It took several years to crack. And what I did is I put screws, I put concrete screws that are coated in epoxy. And then I did this over the top so that I have a control joint but then my casters, you know, the wheels that you have on your toolbox and stuff to make sure that they don't fall into these and get stuck. You know, you've seen the memes about uh, a hydraulic floor jack. It lift all this weight, four tons, whatever, but it can be stopped by a single little bump like a zip tie. I wanted to do my control joints a certain way and you'll see how we got around that. We used a concrete cutting saw. It makes a great control joint without being too big. It can chip on the ends, you gotta be a little bit careful. Had some chipping happen, but I was able to get it to crack where I wanted it to crack so that it looks neat and orderly. And then you can go back and seal those so that it doesn't get water in it, freeze and break more. The nice thing about these big ones and with the big edges, and the reason why they do all these in a lot of places is, you know, inside it shouldn't freeze. Uh, but they basically make it so that the ice pushes up. It has an escape route. It's shaped like a V, so that it has somewhere to go at the top. But you can fill it with stretchy kind of stuff. What am I looking? Polyurethane. You do that, and then it can flex and move and do it. It's expanding and contracting the concrete's got to do. And at the same time, not let water in. And the water expand and frost wedge. They call it frost wedging. It's like driving a wedge, a splitting wedge in wood. You know, expands. This is how the concrete project went. <laughs> These are the things that happened that went wrong and the tools and the things that were on hand to make it correct to go back to right and then some things that happened with the weather that caused some adverse effects and we'll discuss those too. This is a college level course in concrete just about, not in the comical comical <laughs> you screwed up no not in the chemical reaction state of it so much 
as uh, is just in the mechanics of how to get her done. The first thing you need to do when you're ordering concrete is do the math. What's your square footage, which is basically your length times your width. On my building, it is 32 and a half by 48 and a half. So that comes to 1575. If you're going four inches thick, the magic number is 81. Normal thickness is four inches. So divide 1575 by 81 and you get 19 and change. And so basically I would have 20 yards of concrete. It's 10 yards of concrete per truck, so it should only take two trucks. However, I went extra thick on the floor. And so because of that, my variance or whatever, I wound up doing three trucks. Because in some places I was 12 inches, some places I was 8 inches, and that caused all kinds of havoc with cold joints. We'll get into that in a minute. I would compare doing concrete and saying what all the different parameters are to doing uh, welding on a machine like this. But you've got your heat and you've got your speed and you've got all this stuff going on. And in order to know where to set it, you've got a chart. And the chart also has a variable for gas. So you figure what you're doing, stainless steel or steel, solid wire, flux, all this kind of stuff, right? And then that'll tell you what to set the heat at and what to set the fire speed at. Another variable would be the thickness. And another variable is if you're 120 volt or 220 volt. There's all of these different combinations, right? So concrete's the same way. Uh, but your variables are your wetness, how much water you're putting in it, um, how many bags mix per cubic yard you are, and there's all kinds of other stuff with it, and we'll go over those right now. This is my concrete price sheet, <laughs> or, or how you order it. If you're going to order a pizza, it's easy because you've done it a few times. The first time you did it, you know, it's like, what's their special, what sizes do you want, what do you want on those pizzas, and where do you want to get it from. Concrete's the same way, depending where you get it you may have to adjust up or down on what your slump is we'll talk about that in a second and you may have to change uh, what bag you have you know like a six bag seven bag five bag or whatever it's going to be um, the main thing on your order is you know like what kind of pizza do you want what are you doing uh, we're doing a floor and we're going to burnish it and the burnishing if the concrete people know that then they know that you don't want to put air in it if your concrete's going to be outdoors like a driveway, sidewalk, uh, barn floor that's not heated and air conditioned, uh, then you do want air in it. So and these are just micro teeny teeny tiny little bubbles that kind of work like the pea gravel or the rocks do. They kind of create a space between and it's a compress and expansion kind of cushion in the concrete so that it doesn't crack and break up so much when it's uh, getting warmer and colder. Uh, the disadvantage to that is that it's not as strong heavy duty kind of stuff per, per se you know like a warehouse floor um, you would not want air in it you'd say no no thank you you know if you're going to burnish it if you're going to polish it with the machine we're going to talk about that show what that's like later on in the video but basically things wipe up off the floor easier it's you know harder better kind of cool stuff number one what are you going to do and are you going to pump it or pour it we are pouring it so we know that we want to use rock because rock is stronger. There's smaller spaces between it and rocks have already been super compressed. That's how they got to be rocks by lots of heat and pressure. So, but if you are going to pump it, then you want pea gravel. Um, and you know your mix, how much rock do you want per how much concrete or you know how much cream per whatever. If you're doing stairs, I'm going to jump all over and then we'll go down through the list. If you're doing stairs, you want to do pea gravel kind of small rock because then if your surface next to a rock, it will be very small. It'll be just like a little detail and you can like boop, push it in and then cream it back over or vibrate it and then the board, you know, form vibrates it and kicks the rock back and then you get a nice cream uh, surface to look at. This is a cross section of stairs versus if you do big rocks, big rocks give you more strength because then you have smaller gaps and stronger material in it and it, it's just great stuff. But if it's against the side of a wall and it's vibrating, it's not going to be able to kick it back into the mix. Rock is stronger, and for a floor you want rock because you don't have to worry about the sides. Gravity is going to push the rocks down so you don't have to worry about vibrating it. It works awesome. Right, okay. So let's look at you get on the phone, this is your phone, put it up to your ear. We are pouring such and such and such and such. So the company or your pizza place or whatever is going to know what you're talking about. They're experts on it and they will recommend or if you order the wrong thing, they're like, are you sure? 
you want pineapple on that pizza. Are you sure that you want to do a, uh, a slump that's only three inches when you're doing flat work? Flat work, you should be a five inch slump. And what this is, is basically wetness. You take an 18 inch cone, fill it full of concrete, flip it over, dump it out. And if it slumps or goes, you know, sags basically about five inch, that's that much wetness. So the more inches it slumps, the more wet it is. What if, what if it's just way too much water and it just turns into a mud pie? So then that would be like way too much. So that would be like 17, 16, 15 inches of slump possible, right? Uh, no slump at all, you know, zero inches of slump would be, you know, just really, really dry concrete. So a three inch slump is good for footings. A five inch slump is good for uh, flat work because you got to get it smooth enough to where you can get a nice uh, finish, a nice cream on top, right? Uh, so the bag mix is your strength. If you're only going to be, you know, like 2,500 PSI, 1,000 PSI, then you're going to have a low bag mix number in your order. So if you want seven bag and, uh, you know, engineered or not engineered, it's basically filler of the ash that I talked about earlier. If you have ash in it, it's basically going to have the same strength by some miracle. Uh, but it may cost less, so you save a teeny bit. It's good insurance policy to say, I want a seven bag full. That means the full mix, no filler, no ash in it, right? And then they want to know what weather that you have. And then they can recommend things like hot water or calcium. Right now, concrete in this area is $177 per yard. I looked up online, it says, oh yeah, concrete, 65 bucks a yard. I don't know where in the planet that is, but that's amazing because you typically round up when you're estimating 180 a yard and that's three feet by three feet by three feet cubed you know that's a cubic yard of concrete if you want to add hot water it's five bucks a yard if you want to add per one percent uh, calcium it's five bucks a yard per percent so if you wanted two percent and you wanted to kick off really fast like all hands on deck working like crazy to get this stuff done it would be ten bucks a yard so if you add uh, five yards it would be 50 bucks got it easy so we know what slump is it's how much water's in it we know what the air's for it's for outdoor concrete and the, the place that heats and cools a lot like Utah bag mix we talked about that more bag mix more strength PSI also for the wetness it's like how easy is it to move around how easy is it to get the cream and get a smooth finish the more slump you have the harder it is to make stairs stairs what would that be it would be like maybe four I don't know I don't do stairs and this example is basically what I am learning from from. As far as the weather goes, we know about additives and what we're going to do for that. And then for pea gravel, if you're going to pump it through a tube, then you need to do pea gravel. If you're going to do nice pretty edge stuff, pea gravel, otherwise rock has a strength advantage. That is a lot to take in. So feel free to pause the video, review it, rewind, whatever. Make sure that you get this question answered correctly. What are you pouring when you call it in? And then they can help you with the other stuff or ask for the recommendations. Don't be afraid to do that. Check the weather, check your measurements and know what you're pouring and you'll be in good shape. Now that we know all of this stuff, let's look at some fancy power tools of the trade of doing concrete and look at some of the techniques for making the floor really nice and flat. But you have to get your utilities in before you do your floor. Anything that's going to come up through the floor, get it done, backfill it, compact it really good. Once you've compacted it, the next step is to lay down your gravel. When you've got your gravel laid down, Hopefully you have a good driver that makes it a lot easier for you. Thanks, Craig. Spread gravel. You can change it so it doesn't open all the way. It makes it work like a dispenser. But once you've done that, then compact it again. Most of my floor, and according to city code, you have to have your stuff sit for, what, like three years and let the weather make it rock hard. Other thing you can do is when you excavate it, make sure that you use a butter blade. No teeth on the excavator, no teeth, uh, skid steer, whatever you're using. It's got to be the smooth blade so that everything's cut and compact because otherwise if it's loosened, it will settle. So we got the lines all marked out. We got it five and a quarter plus whatever variance in the gravel. No high spots. Got a gas line sticking up. It says don't bury behind beyond this. We're right about there. We'll tie into that later. We got a box in for the drain. 
you got water, you gotta have a place for it to go. They got stakes in the middle and they've got marks on them with a Sharpie pen, just to show how deep to go. You got the line all the way around the outside. You got rebar kind of in the middle. Just drill it and pound it. Got a little bit of a deep spot here. I'm gonna do an anchor, like an eyelet anchor or mount for a winch. So if I need to pull something in, I can do that. So I've got just a little bit of retainment here before it goes to slope. I got rebar bent over across here. These were all sticking up before. So it's here. That means the job is gonna turn out good. Good thing he came. He's getting crap for his uh, Steeler shirt. So rugby Pro team. Provo rugby Steelers, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not the Pittsburgh Steelers, they suck. <laughs> There's the first of it. Bam! So it begins. It's exciting. I'm back in most of these trucks. Says, please help me to back safely, just not this one. So you see that one rebar I put in there. This big thick pipe or bar or whatever here, you can see how they're using it as a level. The top of that bar is equal with that Sharpie mark on these posts. When you twist the handle, it changes the angle of it. So if you go clockwise or counterclockwise, it'll make it move like that. I got this all braced up because you can't make it perfect straight up and down when you're wrestling all the other stuff. You see the rebar sticking out. The rebar's there to keep it from sinking or settling too far. This is the magic that Toa brings. He, he, see, he sees what needs to be done and he gets it done. See how he's pushing his foot up and down? What that does is it causes all the air to come up out of the top and it also causes the rocks to get down underneath the stuff. That bouncing and jouncing causes the rock to settle in. Gravity pulls them down, gets cream at the top, and it causes the concrete to be strong because there's not air in it and there's not gaps. I'm gonna thin her here. See the boards and stakes that keep the man door. than you think to get everything just right and just level. It takes a lot of guys. So who's got the better job? These guys or you? Oh, we do. You do for sure. <laughs> it's a lot easier. I guess it's so thick you don't have to do rebar, but I can't see no one. running the level and they set the bar and uh, it helps the street machine. The fiber strike, that sounds cooler than power screeder. Power screeder sounds nerdy. That makes it so you get a lot done quick with good accuracy. We're letting the concrete hold up the rebar. Just put it in the bottom so that it can't pull apart. So he's running the line, he's doing the outside edge. So he gets it just right, and then the power screeder picks up the other side, so that everything stays together true. So he's doing the same thing, just working the line so that you got a reference to run off of. So you use a laser and you set it in the middle, get your bar right, you got a line on this side, and then that thing goes across all the way, so you just do it in uh, about 10, 10 or 11 foot sections. And that thing is so much faster than doing it with a two guys in a two by four. Way straighter too. Dude, nobody has to be barking at each other. They're all gelled, they know what to do. That's the beauty of having somebody with a team that has experience working together like that. You do this by yourself with your buddies for the first time. It's like, do this, do that. By the end of it, your nerves are kind of shot. Not to mention, it's just hard work. You don't overwork it. 
but you gotta make sure you got enough material. It's like once it's pretty, I'm like, nope, leave it alone. When I do this, my floor or my surface, it's all wavy. When these guys do it, it's perfect. They're pretty close. See those little blobs of concrete? They put those in the middle as pylons. So they just took a little piece of that off and that made up the distance to be able to do that. He's coming out to do clean out now. So that's two trucks. We need a third truck, obviously. And they're just taking forever. They said they'd be 15 minutes and it's been almost 30. There's a 40 minute gap between the last truck and this one for pouring. We gotta feed him some cord. Still doesn't even look like we're gonna have enough concrete even with this truck. So at least he knows what to do. He's vibrating between the old pour and the new pour. With the old pour, you get all these air pockets and things. You create all kinds of weakness and cracking in the floor. You see he's tamping it hard, trying to get the liquid action going again. Telling him get it up so it splashes it in. You gotta get it to splash because you got all the air pockets that have for, been forming the whole time we've been waiting for the truck. Getting into some good cream. But all the rest of this would not, it wouldn't screech for anything. It's just too hard on the sides. It's hard to get it exact when it's been sitting for 40 minutes. You see Brandon over there with the Wacker vibrator trying to get things to settle in. I was frustrated and I caused the problem and I didn't know it and that added to their frustration. We're putting the board in now. We kept it out so we could drive trucks all the way up in there. Brandon's a friend of mine. We go riding and skiing together and he didn't even call me out on what was going on. He just rolled with it and made it work. We watched this screech really fast and easy and now you just gotta fight it and fight it and fight it. Way, way harder if you don't get one continuous pour. So this is a big long one that he was getting it done so fast with. Now he's got to do a short one and even with the short one it just takes forever. So when you have an interruption in pour, like I said, it's a lot more work. It creates a joint that you have to unjoint through all this vibration and beating and settling. You really got to work to get it back. The good news is these guys have the equipment to do it. If you didn't have the vibrator or you didn't have the shorter street thing or if you weren't equipped for it, you'd be screwed. So whenever you get concrete, you have to wash it out and have a place to do that. Or if you have a gravel driveway or something, you can just spread it out, just hose it down. Basically what you're making is just a thin layer of really, really weak stuff so when you drive on it, it just blends in with the rest of the gravel. When you're done, you just take all your tools, lay them out. Again, it's nice if you have a gravel driveway with your project. You can just rinse all your tools off into the gravel, spread it out, drive it over. In the spring, it's just the same as all the rest of it. So it was my very own, yeah, it was very much. A month. Oh. And uh, just banging concrete off of everything, pulling all the stakes out. Everybody's traveling around the outside. We've got Toa in the corner. Hey, who put Toa in the corner? Nobody puts Toa in the corner. Toa, you gonna take that? <laughs> so we've been burnishing this over here. There's trowels that you can put on your knees so that you can do it before it's dry. And you do that with your hands. <laughs> So all of this been troweled and gone over pretty good. And now we're going back over what the third truck, you know, that 40 minute wait. We waited about an hour, but the problem is that it cooled down. So we're having to wait even longer.
Dude, I'm thrilled. It's looking awesome. We need more sun, we get more like that. Yeah. Glass. I have a heater. I have like a forced air heater if you think we ought to get that out. We got a couple hours of light. This my little wall turned out awesome. So glad I did that. So it's like 4.30 now. You can totally see the shape of Utah. <laughs> it's the Utah patch for the third truck set. So that second truck didn't have as much mud in it, did it? No. Same? But that end was deeper. In the middle was the deep. Yeah, it was really deep. So that's where he lost a lot. Then we gained as he came. That is a thin trowel. Burn. Burn, I can do that by hand. Right? Yeah. You have to go over like three times. You can see the line where the cold edge is. Is it good? This is slick. See it? So the floor actually turned out really good. I couldn't be happier with a lot of aspects of it. Uh, it was exothermal for a couple of nights, and then on the third night, a cold front came in, and this is what that looked like. Third night, this is the critical one for the floor to not freeze. It's going to be like 17 degrees. That's my uh, garage post that got jacked up in packaging or whatever. So we're just throwing that on there. Uh, but man, it just finally died down for three hours. I've been babysitting this. Every single one of these blankets has been ripped up and like hanging over the wall. We've got uh, six blankets here. Anyway, it's just really important that they stay on tonight. It's been stressful to say the least but i think we're there i think we made it this is a quick after shot i put some boards in here to handle the expansion and contraction of freezing and whatnot till i get other concrete in with a proper expansion joint as you see here there's a pattern in the floor you don't see any cracking outside of the relief cuts that have been put here uh, you can still see the shape here all the way around but there's not any cracking and then this joint was off of where the cold joint was. Cold joint comes around here. Like I say, it's kind of a funky texture. We weren't able to get it very smooth. It's kind of coarse right there. So if you spill oil there, it's not going to wipe up very good. But the rest of the burnishings turned out really nice. You see, it's got a nice shine on it. Um, this was all the cold or after part that. Uh, wasn't able to be done as well. As far as the cold weather and the freezing, this one had a slower cool down. Uh, concrete's an exothermic reaction, which means that it puts off heat as it dries. This continued to put off heat for a longer period of time. I don't see a whole lot of chipping and spalling uh, out here, but here I do. This was cooled down. You can see I've got some pretty big spall spots just pretty much everywhere not the end of the world still really happy with the concrete job especially as hard as it was to get concrete at the time but there was a lot of spalling in these areas because the concrete blankets as you saw they blew away and there's just nothing you could do about it i would have had to double or triple layer this and then have support on it i think a lot of these it just blew off completely at the no in the night problem with the support is when you support it with stuff on top then it causes it to not insulate as well. Insulation does best if there's that uh, layer of air to prevent the temperature from moving through. If you compress it, then it loses R value. R, of course, meaning that it's just the rating of how well it insulates. So I think this is in the new spot. There's, there's a bunch of spalling in the new spot too. Like I say, that's just from the concrete blankets being blown off, but overall, I'd take this floor over most any of the others that I see any day. Bonus footage at the end. Next one's called The Whole Load. In a western town in the days of old, before the mines closed down from the lack of gold, folks there seized opportunity and built them a right smart community. They built them a school where the arts was taught, built them a church on a corner lot, and they painted her white with a steeple high to greet townsfolk as they was passing by. They had him a sheriff, a judge, and a mayor, but they needed a preacher to make things square, so they sent back east, as was the general rule, and hired one fresh from divinity school. Well, when Sunday come, he was all decked out to preach his sermon, whisper and shout, but 
when he stepped up to the podium, it was all too obvious that no one had come. Except one old cowboy in a pew back there in his Sunday shirt and his greased down hair. He just sat there quiet and stared at the floor with occasional glance towards that church's door. Time stood still for the longest while till that preacher had coughed and faked a smile. <clears throat> I guess we could try it again next week. But emotion drained, he could hardly speak. His demeanor was out of a scolded pup, and he turned to leave when old Jake spoke up. Now hold on there, preacher. Tain't your fault. It ain't like them doors has got no vault, and because there ain't no locks for to keep folks out, and if you don't preach now, Satan's won the bout. Now if I hauled out a whole load of hay and only one cow showed up, she'd get fed that day. Well, this preaching man for the last few days had found it hard to cope with these western ways, but he allowed us how he'd found his call from this profound man with this western drawl. So he fixed his collar. He stood up straight and he began to expound on the pearly gates. And he amazed himself at his own recall of that book he waved, chapter, verse, and all. It was God Almighty's omnipotent power that he lectured on for over an hour. Then the wages of sin. Then the hell's brimfire, and he didn't weaken, and he didn't tire. He was jumping and screaming and pounding the floor when, when he noticed old Jake weren't awake anymore. This made him mad. He stomped to the pew. He shook Jake's shoulder and said, I'm word through. You're the one who told me about that cow getting fed. Now you're acting like you're home in bed. You're right there, Preach, about them things I told you. And if I would that load of hay, it'd still be true. That cow would get fed. Tis a cowman's coat. But I wouldn't feed her the whole darn load. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.